seated. Hallelujah, Christ arose. What a magnificent and wonderful truth. A truth that if we do not have it, if it is not true, if we do not believe it, we have no hope. But because it is true, and those of us who have believed that it is true, not only have hope, but we have guarantees given to us by the very hand of God. The passage under consideration today is 1 Corinthians 15, verses 13 and 14. If Christ be not risen. 1 Corinthians 15 can be roughly divided into five different sections. In other words, the resurrection of Christ makes a permanent impact on the believer in five different ways. First of all, we see in verses 1 through 19 of that chapter, and I encourage you to turn to 1 Corinthians 15 with me so that you can see the verses as we make reference to them. First of all, we see in verses 1 through 19 the gospel and the resurrection. Gospel means good news. God has given us some good news that should lift us out of our sorrow and despondency, despair and hopelessness. It's not bad news, it's good news. That's what the word euangelion, translated gospel, means. It is good news and it is connected to the resurrection. We discover in verses 1 through 4 that the gospel is the good news by which we are saved. You might say saved from what? Well, certainly saved from our sins. That is one of the main themes of this chapter. But also saved from hell, also saved from destruction, also saved from the judgment of God that will come. And Paul will speak of that later in this chapter. First of all, the first of the five areas where the resurrection of Christ makes a permanent impact on the believer is salvation from sin and hell. It is the gospel. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved. The resurrection is essential for our salvation. Verse 3 and 4, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. The good news is that there has been made a provision to take care of the sin that condemns us before a holy God. That is good news. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. That is, according to the things that were prophesied in the Old Testament, hundreds of years before the death of Christ, where they foretold the exact details of what would happen on the cross. It was not guesswork. It was not by accident. It was not a coincidence that certain things happened. God himself ordained that they would happen, told the prophets in advance, and then literally, to the very letter, fulfilled those events in the death of Christ. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried. And then verse 4, the last half, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. God, in eternity past, had produced among the members of the Godhead, and you have in your bulletin today a, an insert about the Trinity, God had produced a, a magnificent plan of redemption. He had determined the details of that plan. He had determined that he would execute that plan, and the second person of the Godhead, our Lord Jesus Christ, would become man so that he might die on the cross for our sins. The scripture tells us, without the shedding of blood, 
There is no remission. That is, there is no sending away of sin. And so Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and was buried and rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. That is the first of the five divisions that we see in 1 Corinthians 15. The second is what's been called the eschatological significance of the resurrection. Now that's a big word, theological word. What that means is the prophetic future in relationship to the resurrection. Not only will there be salvation for those who believe from sin and from hell, but the resurrection guarantees a great body of events that will occur in the future. Those of you who were with us at the sunrise service today know that we covered this magnificent body of truth as we saw the lamb that had been slain standing in Revelation chapter 5. And all that follows that, all that goes beyond Revelation 5 that will yet occur is because Christ is risen. Magnificent truth concerning eternity future. The third part of this passage is crisis courage for living in a dangerous world and the resurrection. The resurrection gives us what we call crisis courage to be able to live in this dangerous world. That's what we call the Christian life. Without the resurrection, the Christian life is meaningless. Without the resurrection, there is no sense to living like a Christian. You might as well, as Paul says, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. The fourth division, which is verses 35 through 50, is the removal of all sickness and sorrow and disease and death. The removal, oh, what a wonderful day that will be. Within the past two weeks, this congregation has seen the death of two of our beloved. One man, one woman. You knew them. You loved them. They are with the Savior in glory today, but only because of the resurrection of Christ. And because of the resurrection of Christ, there is coming a day, according to verses 35 through 50, where there will be a removal of all sickness. Are you sick? Some of you here are. Are you dying? Perhaps some of you here are. All sickness, sorrow, disease, and death. The fifth part of the chapter tells us of the resurrection and the rapture. It is given to us in closing as a point of comfort, wherefore comfort one another with these words. It is given to us to motivate us with a sense of urgency. There is work to be done. That great promise is given to us to have a changed focus so that we will take our eyes off of time and focus our eyes on eternity. The gospel and the resurrection, the future and the resurrection, the Christian life and the resurrection, the removal of all sorrow, sickness, disease, and death, and the resurrection, and a change of focus from time to eternity. What a wonderful, marvelous truth the good news is. But you say, how do we know that it's true? Paul tells us there in verse 6, he is speaking of the resurrection and of those who were eyewitnesses. And you say, well, those first group of eyewitnesses, well, they were a little too close to the subject, so, you know, can we really trust them? Well, he goes on in verse 6. After that, he was seen above 500 brethren at once, 
of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. That's a legal argument that would stand up in any court of law. If you had 500 witnesses to an event and their testimony all was in line and they came and were willing to put their lives on the line for that testimony, you have the solid, absolute forensic evidence that is necessary in a court of law to prove any point. And so it was with the resurrection of Christ. Paul makes a point of these eyewitnesses. He makes a point of the impeccability of the eyewitnesses because even in his day there were those who were denying the resurrection. And the verses that we're looking at today, verses 13 and 14, are in the heart of his argument. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some of you that there is no resurrection of the dead? It sounds like he's talking to people today. We are surrounded by people who are saying there is no resurrection of the dead. When you die, you die. That's it. It's over. So live like you please right now because there is no resurrection of the dead. Dear friends, they were saying that back in the days of Paul. That's nothing new. You haven't learned that because of some scientific evidence that has come. The heart of man is very, very hard. Jeremiah tells us it's deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Yes, there are those who do not like the thought of the resurrection because they know that if the resurrection is true and that if someday we will also rise from the dead, that there will be a day of reckoning. There will be a point of accountability. And they do not want to think about the resurrection. But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. Ye are yet in your sins. That's powerful, people, if you understand what he says. Paul leads off the chapter with the gospel and witness to the resurrection because none of the rest of the arguments are either valid or relevant if those two elements are not true. If the gospel is not true, it doesn't matter about the resurrection. If there are no witnesses that are credible witnesses, then it does not matter matter. If Jesus died and rose again, but only did it to show his power and not to provide an atonement for sin, the death of Christ is, in a very practical sense, irrelevant to us. That would have been a theological proof of his deity. It would have been a theological proof of his power. But unless it was for our sins, it would be irrelevant to us. If the resurrection had no credible witnesses and stood on shaky historical ground, it would be meaningless. And all that Paul says about the importance of the resurrection for future events would be patently untrue. Yet that's the point of verses 13 and 14 and verse 17. If Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, you are yet in your sins. Without the resurrection, we are all self-deluded fools. Our faith would be meaningless. Do you realize that is, in fact, what the world thinks about us as Christians? That's what the world thinks about us, that we're nuts for wasting one good day every week, dressing up and going to hear some dull moron babble fairy tales while they, the enlightened ones, 
soak up sun at the shore and sip their martinis. Paul understood that critical issue with painful clarity even in his day. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. But it's worse than that. Did you hear the second half of that verse? Ye are yet in your sins. The issue of sin is still there even if the resurrection is not true. Even old Miss Goody Two-Shoes, who thinks that she's perfectly self-righteous, must admit that there are some pretty bad people in the world, even if she doesn't think that she's one of them. She'll frankly tell you all about the rotten marriage of her neighbors next door. She'll tell you in an angry tone how the kid down the street, how bad he is because he rode his bike through her flower garden. You see, even if the resurrection is not true, you still have the problem of sin. And if you're honest with yourself, you must admit that you have committed a few sins in your own life too. And the wages of sin is death. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But that's Paul's point here. If the resurrection is not true, not only is your faith empty and deluded, but that means that you are still shackled by your sins and on your way to hell. That makes the resurrection a seriously important issue. That central argument is surrounded here in the text by eight other obvious and critical issues. Number one, if the resurrection of Christ is not true, there will never be a resurrection of anyone else. And so your faith is worthless. Number two, there's also the formula in reverse. If there is no resurrection of the dead, then obviously Christ is not risen from the dead. Number three, without the resurrection of Christ, preaching is empty puffing of wind, like me standing here today in this pulpit. Number four, Without the resurrection, trusting in Christ is an empty exercise in futility. You see, just believing something doesn't make it so if it's not grounded in fact. Number five, if there is no resurrection, it makes Paul, me, and everyone else who has ever taught the resurrection into a false witness. Now, this is a critical point, folks. Listen very carefully to this. It makes us into false witnesses. And you realize that in the Old Testament, the law required the stoning of false witnesses to death. There were very specific cases where that would occur. One of them was being a false witness when people's lives depend on it. Folks, not just your life, but your eternity depends on it. And I am witnessing to the resurrection of Christ. Being a false witness when people's lives depend on it is a capital offense. Number six, without the resurrection, your faith is vain, empty, insecure, worthless, stupid, and a waste of time. Number seven, without the resurrection, sin still binds you with its chains. And eighth, without the resurrection, you will never see your dead loved ones again. And you will certainly never see Christ and all the promises of the future of which we spoke at the sunrise service today. That's just the first division. That's part one, the resurrection and the gospel. And that leads us to the second part of 1 Corinthians 15, the eschatological significance of the resurrection, the things of future promise. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept? For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive, but every man in his own order. 
Christ the first fruits. Afterward, they that are Christ's at his coming. Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Dear friends, that is the future based on the resurrection. Paul began that second section, as we saw a moment ago, by reminding his readers of the prophetic significance of the Jewish feasts. Just as Christ is the fulfillment of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, for he is the bread come down from heaven, in his own words, and he is the fulfillment of the Feast of Passover, he is God's Paschal Lamb, slain before the foundation of the world for us, says he is God's sacrificial lamb that taketh away the sin of the world and the risen lamb of Revelation 5. Even so, here Paul says Christ is the firstfruits of them that slept. Firstfruits is one of the feasts of Jehovah that God gave to the people of Israel which portray and foreshadow the coming Messiah. And Paul makes reference to that here, where he says Christ is the first fruits of them that slept. He is the first to have a permanent resurrection from the dead, never to die again. All the others who died and were revived under ministries of various prophets in the Old Testament or in the ministry of Jesus or the ministry of the apostles in Acts died again. But Jesus rose never to die again. Paul then moves immediately and most importantly back to the starting point of sin. You see, that issue must be dealt with. It's a key issue in relation to the gospel, but it's also a key issue in relation to the future. And so he starts back at creation with the fall of Adam and Eve. How closely the resurrection is tied to the problem of sin. If there is no historical Adam and Eve, and if there is no historical fall, the resurrection is irrelevant. Regardless of its historical veracity, in other words, if there is no fall, man is not a sinner by nature and by choice. If man is not a sinner, Christ did not have to die for our sins. If his sacrifice is not an atoning sacrifice, there is no need for his resurrection. That is why the doctrine of fiat creationism, ex nihilo, out of nothing, exactly as described in the Bible, is so absolutely necessary. The doctrine of creation is not only necessary, to understand the essential nature of the fall and the redemptive plan of God at the cross and empty tomb, but it is also necessary for any rational understanding of the consummation of all things, the end, the prophetic future. Every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward they that are Christ has come, uh, at his coming. Then cometh the end. And jumping down to verse 26, the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Did you get that? If the resurrection is not true, then the only thing that is eternal is death. Let me say that again. If the resurrection is not true, then the only thing that is eternal is death. That's a horrifying thought, is it not? Death is the last enemy to be destroyed. The first fruits resurrection of Christ is necessary for the rapture and for his second coming. His return for the bride, the church, is necessary for our resurrection. Our resurrection must precede the end and the rule of Christ over all of his enemies. Verses 23 through 26. 
Paul states it very clearly. He's very logical. Paul was not a moron. He was a highly skilled logician. He understood the implications of his faith in Christ. A man who had been a persecutor and a murderer of Christians. A man who stood by holding the coats of those who stoned the first martyr to death, Stephen. A man who was zealous for the Old Testament law. And Jesus met him on the road to Damascus and blinded him with the Shekinah glory of God and said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the voice came from the glory of God and said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks, the ox goads. And his immediate response was, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? When we come face to face with the resurrected Christ, when we understand who he is, when we understand the impact of that theology, it changes our lives. It changed Saul from being a murderer of Christians into the Apostle Paul. Transformations like that do not happen by accident. The living God reached down and touched him in the midst of history to show him how great things he must suffer for my sake. Dear people, the resurrection is necessary and must precede the end of the rule of Christ over all of the nations. And then and only then will death be destroyed. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. If the resurrection is not true, the only thing that lasts forever is death. That is the ultimate conclusion that the unbelieving pagan must arrive at if he or she is a thinking man or woman. The only thing for which you have to look forward is death that goes on and on and on forever. Paul has made his point, I think, well. The third part of the chapter, crisis courage for daily living and the resurrection. He speaks here about those who are baptized for the dead. This has nothing to do with Mormon theology. He's talking about those who as they saw the testimony of the martyrs, were encouraged to stand and be willing to be publicly counted for their faith, which in many cases resulted in their deaths. Why stand we in jeopardy every hour, says Paul? I protest by the rejoicing which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord. I die daily. If after the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantage is it me if the dead rise not? Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Be not deceived, evil communications corrupt good manners. Awake to righteousness and sin not, for some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. There were Christians who were secret Christians. There were Christians where if they were brought to trial, there would not be enough evidence to convict them. They believed deep in their heart, but they never would speak out. Paul is saying, if the resurrection is not true, then it doesn't matter whether you do or not. It's insane to do anything that would jeopardize your life. If the resurrection is not true, then when you're dead, you're dead. It would be crazy to die for something that was not true if the resurrection is a hoax. Then in verse 33, Paul argues that the reason he is willing to put his life on the line every day is because the resurrection is, in fact, true. That's why Paul risked his life. That's why the early apostles went to their deaths with the joy of Christ on their lips. That's why Christians through the centuries have been willing to lay down their lives for the faith is because of the resurrection. He gives the illustration, as you saw, of a 
uh, an arena where the wild animals are killing people and eating them. It would be crazy to risk that if the resurrection is not true. We learn four key facts about the resurrection in these next few verses. He talks about, as we've borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. He talks about a celestial observation. He talks about the flesh of different kinds of animals and how the resurrection is different from that. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. First of all, the resurrection body is a changed body, not a different body. It's a changed body. It has different characteristics and character qualities than those which currently limit our physical bodies. In the resurrection body, all those primary physical limitations will be removed. Second, it will be more alive and more fruitful than our current sin-crippled bodies. He gives the illustration of the grain and the fruit. Third, it will have a different kind of flesh than our current body. Very interesting, a substance that is not supported by a stream of blood. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. He gives illustrations of the different kinds of flesh of animals and of fish and of birds, but all of those have a bloodstream that supports their lives. Our resurrection bodies will have some drastically different form of life, some different form that supports us. The Bible clearly teaches that for now, it is the bloodstream that determines the life in our body. And that was the reason for the shedding of blood in the Old Testament sacrifices. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, Leviticus 17, 11. It will be more glorious than our current body. He uses the stars of heaven to illustrate that. And there will be different levels of glory. And finally, he closes in verses 51 through 58 with the time of the resurrection. I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord, Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. If Christ be not risen, your faith is vain, but Christ is risen. And that is the reason that we have the hope of the future and of Christ's return. The resurrection is the basis for all reasonable hope. It is the basis for our eternal future with him. It is the basis for living a godly Christian life. It is the basis for living every moment in expectancy of our heavenly bridegroom. Without the resurrection, all of this is untrue and we are plunged into the deepest despair of meaningless existence. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. He is risen. He is the first fruits of the harvest. That is the guarantee that the rest of the harvest will follow and rise. That is the guarantee that you too you too. I'm speaking to every individual here. You too will rise to meet him, either as your glorious and blessed Savior, or you will rise to meet him as your sovereign judge. Which will it be? Do you know him? Do you know him as your Savior, and your Lord. He died for your sins. He was buried. He rose again. Amen. Gracious Father, how we thank you once again for the great truth of the resurrection. All else in life is meaningless if there is no resurrection. If Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain. You are yet in your sins. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. And how we thank you that because of that we have the glorious hope. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Christ is risen. Amen.
and amen.